Hi everyone, uh, welcome back to uh, Math 221. We've had a little bit of a lighter week this week, which is nice. Um, we're going to be uh, starting Chapter 5 um, on Thursday. This lecture, uh, it's going to be structured a little bit differently. Um, likely it's going to be a little bit shorter. Obviously, I'm recording it right now, so I'm not really sure, um, you know, how long it's going to be. My guess is, though, um, it will be uh, shorter than, than some of our previous lectures. Um, what I've done is we're going to work through um, some problems um, uh, about optimization and specifically, like, um, you know, working with, like, you know, word problems, these more, like, um, um, model building situations. Um, you can see, you know, sort of on the screen, I, I've pre-written uh, the four steps that, that will follow. Um, but but the, but the other thing that's that's different here is uh, normally when I give these lectures, you know, I, I have my lecture notes and I've worked out uh, the problems beforehand just so that everything goes smoothly. Um, but this time, actually, I've I I I have the problems prepared, but I haven't solved any of them. So I'm going to be solving them um, for the first time, and then as I solve them, uh, I'm going to you know speak through my whole thought process. Um, that way you, you can sort of see, um, you know, what the problem solving process is like, you know, when, when you're going through these yourself. Okay, so I've, I've listed four steps that I think um, will sort of guide um, well what we're doing. Um, the first one, I've given this advice um, several times during office hours. For those of you who, who've come to office hours, uh, you'll have seen this one. Um, You'll actually probably have seen the first three um, more directly. Um, but w when you're working with problems like this, you always want to draw a figure, okay, um, and, and then label everything in that, right? Any, any quantity of whatever situation you're working with, draw a picture, okay? And then, you know, in, in these questions specifically, right, um, you'll be trying to, to optimize something, right? So at, at the end of last week, we talked about, you know, optimizing functions. And sometimes, you know, you, you might want to optimize in a given situation, right? So, so you have your figure with its labels, um, and then you find an expression for the quantity that you want to optimize. And then in the third step, we want to um, use the conditions of our situation in order to change that expression, usually, uh, and, and write it as a function of a single variable, right? Because once we have a single variable, along with the domain, right, that we sort of inherit from the, the, the situation that, that, that we're modeling, once you have those two things, we can optimize our function, okay? So let's, um, let's get started with the first one. I, I, I am going to, like... Um, uh, pre-write these. I, I wrote this problem uh, beforehand, um, and then for the previous ones, while I'm, you know, writing it out on the screen, I'll speed up the video. Okay. Um, so, so, so here's the situation. Okay. So, say, say you want to build um, a, a rectangular garden um, and have uh, 50 feet of fencing, not 500. Um, so, so, so you have 50 feet of fencing that, that you want to put. A, around a garden and it says, what's the um, dimensions that would make the, gar the, the largest garden possible, right? Where largest here is in terms of area, okay? So as I said, step one, right? Get ourselves a nice rectangle. And we want to label the quantities. Um, the, the two natural labels, we can call the width X and the height y, okay, that would seem like, you know, the two most natural uh, ways to label that. And then two, we want an expression for the thing we're optimizing in terms of these variables. And this follows fairly quickly, right? We're wanting a, our area, and this is a rectangle, so it's x times y, okay? One and two usually come just a little bit quicker, at least for, for simpler cases like this. Well, let's take a look at number three. What was number three? Well, three said that we want to use the conditions of the problem to write, an ex to, to write our expression as a function 
of a single variable, right? Here we have a function of two variables, right? X and Y, which is not what we want, right? We can't do calculus um, with two variables, right? We, we haven't developed any sort of um, tools to do calculus with more than one variable, so we need to get it into one variable. But we have this nice thing here um, where there's a maximum of 50 feet of fencing. And say, you know, obviously we, we want to use all of it, right? So if we have 50 feet of fencing, well, that needs to be all of this, okay? And so that tells us that 50 is the perimeter, and we can write that in terms of our x and our y, right? 50, in order to, you know, do all of this fencing, I need to do x twice, and I need to do y twice. So 50 is 2x plus 2y, and now we can, you know, slowly start to manipulate this. If we divide both sides by 2, that's going to tell us that 25 is equal to x plus y. We can subtract that x over and uh, isolate our y. We're going to get y is 25 minus x. And what that means is I can take this and if I plug it in here, we, we get a new expression, right? A was equal to xy, but we know y is 25 minus x. So A is equal to x times 25 minus x, or 25x minus x squared, okay? Next, we can sort of turn our attention to the domain, right? What's the biggest and smallest that x could be? Well, clearly the smallest it could be would be zero. You know, it, it, it clearly wouldn't make any sense to have a negative sort of width here. Okay, so we have that zero is less than or equal to x. And what's the biggest that x could be? Well, since it needs to go this way and this way, you know, if we had 25 feet of fencing here and 25 feet of fencing there, that would be 50 feet total. So then 0 is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to 25. And now we have an expression for our area in one variable and a domain. And we're looking to maximize. So those tools that we discussed um, last week now work, right? We can take our derivative, find our, our, our critical points, test our critical points and our boundary conditions, and then we're good, right? We will we'll have figured it out, right? We, we, we can look for the biggest value out of all of those, and we're golden. And now we can do that, right? Because our area is a function of x, and in this case, 25x minus x squared. Taking our derivative, 25x, the derivative of that is 25. And then x squared, the derivative of x squared is 2x. And now we need to find where this is equal to 0. So if 25 minus 2x equals 0, right, then 2x equals 25, or x is 25 over 2. And so now that we have... And so now that we have this, this critical point, we can check them, right? We, our, our, our first boundary condition is when f equals, our first boundary condition is when x equals zero, and if x equals zero, our area is zero. Our critical point, 25 over two, we're gonna see that this is 25 times 25 over two, and then we need to subtract 25 over 2 squared. So that's 25 squared times 2 over 4, right? Once, once we square this, this is going to become a 4, so we need to get a, um, a 4 over there, minus 25 squared over 4. I can factor out this 25 squared times 2 minus 1, over 4, 
And then, of course, this uh, 2 minus 1 is just a 1. So since we're doing multiplication, it's just going to go away. And we're left with 25 squared over 4, um, which if I punch into a calculator really quick, looks like it's going to give me 156.25. We have one more condition to check, right? And that's our other boundary. If um, x equals 25, but if we turn our attention to this depiction of our function, right, rather than this one, we can see really quickly that we'll get 25 minus 25 for zero, okay? And that tells us really quickly that this is indeed our maximum area. So we can write that right here in the corner. So the max area is is 156.25, it's going to be feet squared, okay? And then the side lengths are what, right? And, and now we, we, we want to sort of go back to our model and take a look. Well, we got that x is 25 over 2. So that means that this is 25 over 2, and this is 25 over 2. So then what, what that would then tell us is that these two are, are 25 over 2, totaling 25, right? But then y is 25 minus x. And then 25 minus 25 over 2, well, it's just 25 over 2. So the most efficient way to build this garden is actually to build it as a square, right? So we can just say that it's a square with side length um, 25 over 2 feet. Um, and then my challenge to you, see if you can solve the like general case of this, right? What if rather than the constant of 50 feet, right? What if our constant was something else? What if it was 12 feet? What if it was 500 feet? What if it was an arbitrary K feet, right? Like, you know, whatever K is, it's a constant and sort of work through these numbers and, and see if you can um, come up with, with, with a general solution to this problem, okay? And then, uh, you know, once you've done that, we'll go ahead and move on to our next question. So here's our question. Okay, it says, by, by cutting away um, identical squares from the corners of a 16 inch by 10 inch piece of cardboard, and then folding up the like resulting flaps, you can create a box. And we're looking for the dimensions of the box, which create the largest like volume of that box. And this seemed a little bit daunting at first. You know, we, we saw something similar to this very, very early in, in, in the quarter. We saw it way back before we had even, you know, developed the idea of a derivative. Okay. Um, but now that we have it, we're going to sort of return to um, similar examples um, and see if the derivative can tell us anything more. Right. If I recall correctly, um, before we were just finding an expression for the volume of the, of the box, but now we can optimize it. Okay. So it's it says we have a 16 by 10 piece of cardboard. So I'll um, draw this up. We'll call 16 inches the long side, and we'll call 10 inches the short side given that, well, 16 is larger than 10. That would seem the most, you know, if efficient way to do this, right? Um, and it says we're cutting away identical corners. So something not like that, something like this, 
right, where we're cutting out these corners. That's an eraser. Um, we're cutting out the corners of the box, right, to leave sort of this shape in the middle. And then when it says folding up these flaps, right, it's like folding along these green lines here, um, sort of up this way into the third dimension, like out of your computer screen to create a box. Okay. And why don't I draw those like this? Okay. So those are the lines that we're going to fold along. And we're looking for the way to maximize the volume of this box. I'm actually going to put this on a new page so we have a little bit more room. Just copy and paste it. So once we do that, right, we'll have some box like this, right? And we're looking to maximize the volume. So that means we'll need three variables, right? We'll need length, width, and height. But before we do that, let's actually um, label a little bit more on this guy. What are our unknowns here, right? We, we, we know it's 16 here, and, and we know it's 10 there. But we're cutting out these squares. So maybe we, we can call the size of these squares, you know, x by x. And all of a sudden, that gives us a little bit more information. If these are x by x squares, and this whole thing is 16, well, then that would mean, sorry, the other way, that this width here is 16 minus 1x over here and a second x over there. Right? Similarly, this will do this internally here. We're going to be 10 minus 2x here for the same reason, right? That's the width of, of that flap. And now all of a sudden, when we fold this up, right, where do these quantities go? Well, once we folded this up this height, like this, this line here is this line here. So that tells me that this is going to be x. This line here is this creased line here, right? So that means that this quantity is going to be our 16 minus 2x. This edge here becomes this edge here. So that edge is 10 minus 2x. And you you might be wondering, right, like, why, why am I looking for these specific edges? Well, that's because the volume of my box, right, is this side times this side times this side, right? It's length times width times height. But now that we've written all of these as x's, it's now a function of x, right? It's x times 10 minus 2x times 16 minus 2x. And now all of a sudden, we, we've, we've actually done number two and number three, right? By sort of delaying writing this volume just a little bit. And, and looking for ways to utilize the fact that the square that we're cutting out is, is going to be x by x, right? Because that's the only unknown in the situation is how big of a square. But now that we have the, the dimensions of the box and the volume of the box in terms of x, we need to look for um, domain restrictions, right? We need to think about the smallest possible value for x and the largest possible value of x. Okay, and and for the smallest, you know, it's it's not too terribly um, difficult to think. Well, it's the smallest x could be. 
Well, it has to be zero for the same reason as before, right? This can't ever be negative. It wouldn't make sense to cut negative area out of the corner of our box. So that means that we must be cutting out something positive. So that means that zero is the smallest x can be. As far as the largest x can be, we need to think a little bit more critically, right? We, we know that 16 minus x has to be greater than 0. Or sorry, you know, 16 minus 2x has to be greater than 0. Because if 16 minus 2x is less than 0, then all of a sudden this has negative length. Likewise, 10 minus 2x has to be less than 0. Sorry, has to be greater than 0. I think I said that two times in a row. And now we can rearrange and solve for x, right? 2x has to be less than or equal to 16, or x has to be less than or equal to 8, is, is what the first one gives us. The second one says that 2x is less than or equal to 10, or x is less than or equal to 5. So now the question is, well, which one of these do we use? Well, notice if we're less than or equal to 5, then we're definitely less than or equal to 8. But we can satisfy this being positive if, if x is something like 7. Cutting off a 7-inch square from the corner doesn't affect this um, number here. But if you cut a 7-inch square off, off the corner, now all of a sudden, this side is negative. Right? This, this, this tab here has a width or, or a, a length, how, however you want to think of it, of negative 4 inches. That doesn't make any sense. So that means we're less than or equal to 5 here. OK. But now we have a function and a domain. So now we can optimize right, our function of x is x 10 minus 2x and 16 minus 2x. Before I FOIL this, however, I'm actually going to pull a 2 out of each of these. Right, so we're going to have x times 4, right, because if I pull a 2 out of here and a 2 out of there, our first one then becomes 5 minus x. Our second one becomes 8 minus x. And now if we expand this guy, looks like we're going to get 4x um, times what? 5 times 8 is 40 minus 5x minus 8x is going to be minus 13x. And that's plus x squared. Distributed in our, in our x, we're going to have 4 times x squared sorry, x cubed minus 13x squared plus 40x. And now, finally, we can take a derivative. This constant here on, on the outside is just going to factor through our, our derivative. So we're going to have 4 times what? Well, the derivative of x cubed is 3x squared. The derivative of 13x squared is 26x's, and the derivative of 40x is just 40. And then from here, we need to factor. There's a number of different ways to sort of go about this factoring process. Unfortunately, if you notice, um, these numbers don't have any common factors. They're what we would call um, relatively prime, so we can't factor anything out. I'm sorry, that should be uh, negative 26, because we have a negative here. We're definitely going to need a 3x and an x, right? Because 3 is a prime number. It's the only possible way that that could divide up, OK? And then how, how can we get um, 40 in a specific way? Well, we, we, we can get 40 by 20 and 2, right? And we, we probably want to put that, the, and then we, we probably want to put the 20 here, 
right? Because we, we don't necessarily want to multiply 3x by 20 because that would get a little bit too big for our 26 in there. So that would put 2 there. And then it would seem like we, we would want to go negative and negative, right? Because then we get negative 20x and negative 6x. And this looks to me like the way that it would factor, right? 3x squared, we have plus 40. And then as we just said, minus 20x minus 6x. And so then now that we have this factored, we can easily see that there are two critical points. Right? What are our critical points? Well, one of them is going to be 20 over 3, and one of them is going to be 2. But notice, our domain is between 0 and 5. And 20 over 3 is just a little bit less than 7. So that means that 20 over 3 is actually outside of our domain. And so we can just cross it off. OK, so that leaves us with three points to check. We're going to need to check f of 0. But then since our function has an x out, out front, this is going to be 0. f of 2 looks like it's going to be 2. This factor here looks like it's going to come out to 6. This factor here looks like it's going to come out to 12. So that's 2 times 6 times 12, or 144. And then we need to check 5. But notice 5 makes this guy 0, right? Because 2 times 5 is 10. 10 minus 10 is 0. So. Would you look at that? We have two zeros and 144, and we're trying to maximize area, or sorry, volume. So the maximum volume that, that you can get from cutting up this cardboard box is 144 inches cubed. And then of course, you know, if, if we want to um, look at the box dimensions, what are our box dimensions? Well, it's going to be this, this, and this, right? And we've already worked those out. It's going to be two inches. I'll go back to red for that. Two inches. Our 10 minus 2x is going to give us six inches. And then our 16 minus 2x is going to give us 12 inches. So that's the biggest box that you can make from that piece of cardboard. Now we can move on to our third example. So we have some, you know, um, um, local sandwich shop and they, they have their, their um, special sauce, right? And it's stored in a right circular cylinder um, and they, they have to have a, some, some capacity um, of 54 inches cubed. And, and we're being asked to find um, the radius and height that in this case uses the least packaging, right? So whereas before we were looking to maximize something, here we're looking to minimize something. And so we should draw a picture. Well, we're trying to store this in a right circular cylinder, right? So we need a right circular cylinder. So. Let's say this is our good friend, the right circular cylinder, this red guy. And this um, circular cylinder, which I'll just call a cylinder now, um, it's going to have two defining features. Right? The, the, the two that it's, um, we're actually told to look at in the question. It's going to have some height, say h, and it's going to have some radius call it R. And with those two pieces of information, right, we can totally characterize our um, cylinder. And since we're trying to use right, the least packaging, right, the, the thing that we're trying to minimize here, 
would be our surface area. Now that we have um, our model, right, this would be our step one, we need our step two, where of course in step two, right, we're trying to find a, a, an expression for our desired quantity. And if we're trying to uh, use the least packaging, then the quantity that we're trying to minimize would be the surface area of this cylinder. So then we would need a surf, a, 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 an expression for the surface area of the cylinder. We'll just call it S. And how do we get it? Well, we, we need to account for the top and the bottom circle, right? So we have two times the area of that circle, which is just pi r squared. And then we need an expression um, for sort of this wraparound stuff here. If we were to unwrap that, we would get a rectangle with a height of h and a width of the perimeter of this circle, right? So that's going to be 2 pi r because that is, you know, the standard expression for the uh, perimeter or, you know, cir circumference of a circle. And then if we're looking for the area of this guy, the area of a rectangle, we multiply these two together. So we have 2 pi r h. And then in order for us to go on to step four where we optimize, we need to be able to write this as a function of a single variable, which means we need to you know, write one of these variables in terms of the other. I, I would say the candidate would probably be to write h as a function of r, um, just because we have an r squared here and just a single h. Um, but now the question is, how, how could we go about finding that? And it's right here, right? It's the fact that our cylinder has to have a capacity of 54 inches cubed, which means that 54 needs to be equal to the volume of my cylinder. So then what's, what's, what's the volume of a cylinder? What's the area? times h. And I can rearrange this really quickly to get that h is 54 over pi r squared. And now that we have this, I can substitute this in and write my surface area, still 2 pi r squared, and then we add 2 pi r and our h is 54 over pi r squared, right? Which is 2 pi r squared. Our, our constant is going to be 54 times 2, or 108, right? Our pi's cancel and one of our r's cancel. And then what, what do we know about domain? Well, you know, clearly we know that our radius has to be bigger than or equal to zero because, you know, it wouldn't make sense to have um, a, a negative radius, right? But further, r can't equal zero either. So we have that r is strictly greater than zero for our domain. And then, un unfortunately, um, our model, our, our situation doesn't actually give us an upper bound on this guy. We just have that R is strictly positive, which means that our situation is a little bit different, right? And, and then, of course, you know, we'll need to go about steps three and four separately, but we've actually already done step three right now, or right there, and now we just need to optimize, right? So copying down our function for our surface area, it was 2 pi r squared plus 108 over r. And then now how can we think about optimizing this? Right, since, since we can't use, you know, the like nifty little trick that um, bounded in intervals gave us on the last one, we need to think about this a little bit. If we take a derivative 
and then look at the critical points. Since, since, since we're working on an unbounded interval, right, it's going to get arbitrarily large. And our function is going to be continuous on that interval. That means that if we find a critical point, then the minimum has to occur at one of those um, critical points if it exists, right? And now obviously, you know, I, I wouldn't uh, be working on this problem with you if I didn't know that a, a, a critical point needed to exist, right? Um, but we should, you know, mosey on through the problem and see where it uh, puts us. That means we should be looking at our derivative to, to, to look for those critical points. Our derivative of 2 pi r squared, my 2 is going to drop, my pi is a constant, so we get 4 pi r. And then when we take the derivative of this, right, this is 108 times r to the negative 1. So my 108 is going to stay, the negative 1 is going to drop down, and my negative 1 becomes a negative 2. So then now, of course, the question is, when does this equal zero, right? When do we have that 4 pi r minus 108 over r squared equals zero? But since, since our, our, our domain tells us, tells us that our radius is strictly positive, we can multiply both sides by r squared and get that 4 pi r cubed minus 108 equals zero, right? This is normally not allowed because it will introduce extra solutions. But as long as we check those solutions with, the, um, with our uh, original function, we're good, right? But then from here, what, 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 what do we do, right? We, we can move that um, 108 over to the other side get 4 pi r cubed is 108. Dividing by that 4 pi, well, pi can just stay as a constant. 108 divided by 4 looks like it's going to be 27. Right, so r cubed is 27 over pi. And so this should be, I just realized, I'm sure some of you noticed this. Maybe you did, maybe you didn't. Um, but we're dealing with a function of r here, not x. We have that r cubed is 27 over pi. We can take cube roots now and see that r is the cube root of this guy. But the, the cube root of 27 is 3. And unfortunately, the cube root of pi is just the cube root of pi. So that means that we have a critical point at r is 3 over the cube root of pi. How can we tell if this cube root of pi is, a, is, is, is the absolute minimum, right? Well, we, we can use the second derivative test for that, right? If we plug it into the second derivative and it's negative, then it must be a local minimum. And if it's the only local minimum on an unbounded interval, then it must be the absolute minimum on that unbounded interval, right? So now we need a second derivative. Well, if our first derivative, I'll compute it on this page and then move it over to the uh, next page. If our first derivative is that guy, when, when we take our second derivative, our 4 pi r just becomes 4 pi. And what happens to this guy? Well, my 2 is going to drop down, right? And, and my sign is going to change, right? Because negative 1, negative 2. And we, and we need to multiply. 2 times 108 is 216, and we're dividing by r cubed. Ah, but you see, there's something to notice here, right? I was, I was going to move this on, on, on to the next page, because I, I thought we were going to have to actually plug in our, our value of r to, to see if this was um, positive or negative. Notice that this is always positive. Why? Because r is always positive. Since r is always positive, r cubed is always positive, which means this is always positive, which means that when I add 4 pi to it, it's also always positive. But then since our second derivative is always positive, 
and of course, I just realized that I um, think that I misspoke earlier. Um, when you have a local minimum, the second derivative test would then be positive, right? Because a, a local minimum corresponds to being concave up, right? Which is then a, a, a minimum value. And since our function is always concave up, that means that r over three or r over the cube root of pi is the absolute max, which is awesome, right? That's what we what we wanted. We what we wanted to be able to show that this was our, our absolute maximum. And there's one last thing to do, right? We need to find the value of, of h that, that corresponds to our value of r. Our value of r is 3 over the cube root of pi. And h, well, what is h? We know back here that h is 54 over pi r squared, right? Which is, if I just re write it, pi r squared. I can take this value of r, right, plug it in right there, so then h is 54 over pi times 3. I'll write this actually as pi to the 1 third, because I think that will be more useful, squared, which is what? I have 54 over pi times 9 over pi to the um, 2 thirds. So then what happens? Well, 54 over 9 is going to be 6, right? And pi divided by pi to the 2 thirds is pi to the 1 third. So then, of course, this tells us um, that the, the dimensions we want are 3 over the cube root of pi and 6 over the cube root of pi. And that's true, but... There is one cool thing to notice here, right? Um, 6 over the cube root of pi is 2 times 3 over the cube root of pi, which is equal to 2 times the radius, right? This, this would absolutely um, um, be, be acceptable. Um, this, of course, is a little bit cleaner, right? Um, but that means, so we want a cylinder. Um, with r, 3 over the cube root of pi, and h equals twice our radius. For this last question, um, we're going to uh, actually take a look um, at a cost function, okay? Um, and, and, and often, right, um, if you're um, managing a warehouse or, or really in, in charge of, um, like, inventory management uh, anywhere, right? You're sort of um, faced up against a really interesting question. And, 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 and that question is, how much of a you know, particular good should you stock, right? If you stock a whole bunch, you're going to, um, you know, have to uh, pay for housing all of that stock, right? It, it, it would be often not the greatest idea to just order the whole year's stock all at once. You're going to face overstocking issues. But then every time you you order, you know, more of these goods, you're faced with, you know, an, an additional set of costs, right? You know, the cost of shipping, um, the cost of, of you know, um, stocking all of those goods, right? There are costs associated with ordering. And so now we're in a balance of trying to minimize um, the, the, the total cost when there's two variables here. So then your, your cost function in these situations, right, there, there's sort of two parts of it, and they play off of one another, right? You don't want to order too often, in which case, you know, there are those, um, you know, costs that are associated with reordering. But if you don't order often enough, then your um, uh, 
then then the cost of housing those goods is larger, right? Those those storage costs. And and we we I I have an example for you of of a um, situation like this. The the, the you know, um, writing out this question is a bit long, right? So I'm, you know, just sort of talk, talk you through it and sort of write down all of the key quantities, okay? Um, so, so let's say you're selling motorcycles, okay? Um, and you estimate that you're going to send, uh, sell 10,000 uh, per year. Right, ten, ten, ten thousand motorcycles in a year, um, and that every time you order motorcycles, right? Um, so then your cost incurred is say ten thousand dollars a shipment a uh, year. There, so your. Um, so every time you order motorcycles, you have to pay $10,000, right? And we'll say the cost um, of storing each motorcycle um, is $200. Per year, okay. Um, and we're going to make um, a number of assumptions with this, right? Um, we'll assume that um, these motorcycles are going to sell linearly throughout the year. Um, uh, there are ways to deal um, with with the nonlinear case. It takes a little bit more tools. Towards the end of the quarter, um, we'll we'll develop the tools um, to to take a look at that. Um, so if you're super curious, uh, we can chat about that um, sometime during week nine. Um, if you're if you're super curious about how to solve this problem um, for for um, uh, non-linear selling, right? Um, and then we're we're going to assume right um, that. Uh, your ordering calendar is, is perfect, right? Right when you run out of motorcycles, you're going to order new ones, okay? And then as 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 we jump into solving this, right? I I, I want to note something for you, right? Um, you know, we can't really draw a picture here, right? Like it wouldn't really make any sense to. You know, draw a picture of your storage facility, of, of the grounds of this, you know, um, motorcycle shop. Like that, that wouldn't quite make sense. But what we can do is draw a picture of the graph of our inventory over time, right? Um, because since our relationship is linear, we're always going to order the same amount, which means our inventory is going to look like this. Right for for some number of orders, we don't know how, how how many or or how big they would be yet, but our inventory is going to look something like this. Um, where I guess you know since this guy is uh, discontinuous, um, sometimes it's helpful uh, to draw these little sort of dashed lines to show hey this you know this thing's jumping up. Right, um, because as soon as we, we run out, that's bang right when our new shipment comes in. And so the first thing that we kind of want to wrestle with is this guy, right? The cost of storing each motorcycle. And there's a number of ways to sort of think about it. Um, but what I want to draw your attention to is, I, I, I guess you could argue that um, this is an assumption um, but if, but if you sort of sit and and think about it for a, a bit, uh, it, you can see that it's not it, it's it, it's it's well founded. And as far as dealing with um, the 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 cost of storing each motorcycle, what we can do is we can calculate the average inventory over the course of the whole year, right? And then with that average inventory. We, we can multiply that by the cost of storing each motorcycle to give us the sort of, you know, um, um, cost of housing all of the motorcycles that you order over the course 
of the year. And this is where the assumption that we're linear um, is even nicer, right? Because, be because if you think about it, all of these are our little triangles. So what that means is the average inventory is going to be half of your order, right? And 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 this takes a little bit of uh, uh, thinking about, right? I've been, you know, running problems like this, you know, for a while, which is how I'm able to sort of recognize that so quickly. Um, but notice what once we sort of draw that that little line, this area here is the same as this area here. And so if our average order, and then so if, if we're ordering X units, well then our average inventory at any given moment is X over two, right? Averaged across the whole year. And so that's going to tell us uh, that, that the storage cost is, $200 a year times X over two or um, $100 times whatever our order amount is. Okay, so that, that's sort of the like, um, you know, trickier thing uh, to do, right? And so now, now that we have this function, Right, that the, the the cost you know related to the to, to the storing is is a hundred dollars times whatever your order number is. I guess you know I, I'm technically doing this out of order um, from what we've been doing before, right? Um, this would be step one, right? Step two, uh, the function or, or rather the like expression that we're trying to create um, is. Uh, it's our our cost function. Um, our our cost function, right? We're we're looking for what it is, right? And 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 so I just sort of you know skipped that um, and started for number three to sort of write this as a single variable, um, because if you want to get technical, right? Our cost function um, as a function of the number of motorcycles per year, right? Because that's what we're trying to optimize for, right? Um, it's the cost of storing plus the cost of ordering. This graph um, gave us a good way to understand the cost of storing, right? It, it's 100 times x. Um, but now we need to look at the cost of ordering. But that's not too terribly difficult, right? Because the cost of ordering is $1,000 per order, or sorry, $10,000 $10, per order. And, and, and then so if the cost of ordering is $10,000 times the number of orders, we, we now need an expression for the number of orders. And, and further, ideally, our number of orders should be a function of the number of motorcycles in each order, right? Because that's our, our named value X. But if we're estimating 10,000 motorcycles per year, right? Then our number of orders is 10,000 divided by X, right? This is gonna be 10,000 over X which means our, our, our cost of ordering is 10,000 times 10,000 over X, which is then a very large number. Looks like it's gonna come out to 100,000, 100 million, 100 million over X. And since we know our, um, yearly cost function, right, where, where, where x is the number of motorcycles, right, that means c of x, I'm actually going to go to the next page, c of x is the cost of storing 
plus the cost of ordering, right? And then from here, you know, we, we, we want to uh, take a look at our um, domain for this guy. Now, technically, uh, this, the, the smallest number of orders would sound like it would be one, right? Because you can't possibly have zero orders um, for, for two reasons. One, how are you going to get your motorcycles? And two, we're dividing by X. Um, but I can sort of, you know, see, see a pattern related to the last question we did. And rather than saying that one is our um, sort of lower bound for, for our domain, I'm going to say that we're strictly greater than zero for our, our number of orders, which is also true, right? And while, while we could put a cap on uh, our, our domain, you know, maybe it will turn out that um, it's most mathematically viable to have your cost per year ordering a billion motorcycles, right? Maybe it just works out that way. Um, and you definitely want to order, you know, for 10 years in the future, 20 years in the future. My guess is probably not. But let's just consider, you know, arbitrarily large order sizes. But, you know, we're once again left with um, a, a similar problem to last time. Of we're dealing with an open interval here, right? Some un unbounded, it can get as big as you want. But I'm going to claim to you that's not actually a problem, okay? And and uh, we'll see why in in a second. I hope. Um, uh, so let's sort of you know um, continue on just like we did in in uh, the last question. Our derivative is going to be a hundred because this x goes away. My negative one drops down and becomes a negative two. So we're minus 10,000, or sorry, 100 um, million over x. I think I might have called this uh, 100 billion earlier. Um, counting zeros is hard sometimes, I guess. Um, and we want to look for, for um, our, our critical points, right? My, my, my sort of thought here is we can look for critical points um, where, where our derivative equals zero. And then once we have our critical points, we can use the second derivative test to hopefully show that it's an absolute minimum, right? And then uh, that will show that our cost function um, has the, the, the absolute minimum that we find with that critical point, you know, modeled just after we did, or sorry, uh, after just like we did in the last one, okay? So if this equals zero, then 100 million over x squared equals 100, or 100 x squared equals 100 million. We can cancel 100 there with 100 there. And then we need to take square roots. And just looking to me by canceling some zeros, we get x is plus or minus a thousand. But uh, that minus a thousand is definitely out, out outside of our domain. It wouldn't make any sense to order negative a thousand motorcycles. So our critical point. Right, that, that we need to worry about is x equals a thousand. Okay, so now let's take our our, our our second derivative. That 100 is going to drop. Our two is going to be multiplied down, also canceling with the negative. So we get 200 million over x cubed. But again, right, this is, this is very similar to, to the same logic we used in, in, in the last one. Since x is greater than 0, c double prime of x is greater than 0. So x equals 1,000 
corresponds to the absolute minimum, right? Because since my derivative is positive, we're concave up, which means that point needs to be the absolute minimum. Because on this whole interval, my function is doing something like this. So our, our, our critical point has to be the absolute minimum. So then that means we're ordering a thousand motorcycles and, and we should be doing that a thousand or 10,000 10, 10, over X times, right? Or 10 times per year. Um, so you should order a thousand motorcycles ten x per year. Okay, that's uh, going to complete um, the the examples we're, we we uh, looked at today. Um, hopefully, this was helpful for you. Come back Thursday. Um, and we will uh, uh, dive into chapter five. We'll sort of pivot um, and look at a new kind of function that we haven't really talked about all quarter.